Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another brand new episode of Mornings with the Outlaw. I am the Outlaw, John Stephen Roca. Very nice to see you here this morning, recovering from a nice night of sleep after a fun conversation last night with Ben Bateman on the Outlaw Nation show. I hope you all got a chance to watch that live last night. Certainly a lot of people were in the chat, in the comments section. It was a lot of fun to hear you guys' thoughts about what we were talking about. And I tell you what, Ben and I, I had a whole plan out for Ben that I was going to talk about like his beginnings and his life in Seattle and how he got into all the things he got into. He dropped the fact that he had been recording albums before. He was a songwriter, a singer things of that nature, former model. Of course, he was in acting as well. I had so many plans to talk to Ben about all the stuff going on in his world. But of course, you all were in there dropping questions and dropping streamlabs, dropping super chats, which was fantastic. And so we got caught up answering all that. And before you know it, two hours were gone. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that show, uh, the, the the Outlaw Nation show with me and Ben Bateman, let me give it a thumbnail right there. It is available for you to watch after you watch uh, Mornings with the Outlaw uh, here right now as you're watching me live. You can go and watch this right afterwards. Enjoy our two-hour conversation. Hell, break it up into chunks, 15 minutes a day over the next few days and enjoy that conversation so much fun hanging out with him uh it's always a blast to touch base with ben and of course talk about our stuff as well but you are here to join me for mornings with the outlaw to talk about what's going on in the world of entertainment and everything that's happening that broke over the last 24 hours uh and i've got a, a good fun lineup on today we're gonna talk a little bit more about those dune pictures maybe get into some of the looks of it some some people have been complaining that it doesn't look that Fun. Uh, we're going to talk about those still suits that they're wearing in the in the uh, in the pictures as well, and some of D Denis Villeneuve's comments about how he's approaching the film, breaking this thing up into two, or uh, sorry, how he's approaching this adaptation of the Frank Herbert novel, breaking it up into two different films, and why he's approaching it that way. We're also going to get into a little bit of Sam Raimi finally confirming that he is directing Doctor Strange too. I don't think it's that big of a story, but it's worth mentioning, and we'll uh, look at his quotes, and then of course uh, see that reference in Spider-Man 2 uh, that he uh, made uh, inadvertently without even knowing that he was going to one day actually be directing a Doctor Strange movie. And we'll wrap up with uh, James Gunn's comments, uh, or his tweets rather, about the list of films that he thinks are better than the original sequels that are better than the original films. And the big one everyone's talking about is he chose, he chose Blade Runner 2049 over Blade Runner, uh, pretty insane stuff. Uh, I'm going to put a uh, text out to Darina to see if maybe I can get Darina to come in live to give her thoughts uh, here sometime this morning. I don't know what she's up to this morning, so I I'm going to send her the link to the show, and then maybe she can jump in and join me live to talk about uh, James Gunn's comments. We shall see. Uh, so anyway, let's get into uh, Mornings with the Outlaw. Let me say hi to everybody who is joining me here uh, this morning. Uh, let's uh, go down the list here. Uh, let's see. Andrew G is up in here. Andrew Hale is here as well. MK Songbird is dancing with me. Sorry, my uh, volume's a little too high here. Let me turn myself down. Uh, MK Songbird. Yes. Uh, Andrew G, as I said. Rick Morris, Travis Earl. Dude. Yes, Travis. Absolutely. Larry Lee's Holy Mary, Mother of God. Hold on. I got to give this some love. Where is it? Where are you, Larry? Larry, thank you so damn much. Says, just showing my support. Love the show. Larry, thank you. I'm so glad I woke up this morning. What a very kind super chat you sent through, my friend. I appreciate it madly. You know, I know I don't make as much as Roxy does or Riley does uh, or even uh, Ben Goddard playing uh, playing his songs on Twitch, but I do my best to bring you great content. And so I always appreciate when you guys are willing to contribute in super chats or Streamlabs. It means a lot to me. It makes me feel like I'm going in the right direction with the stuff I'm creating here and with the stuff I will be creating more. Um, more down the road. So thank you, Larry. I appreciate the support madly, my friend. Very, very kind of you. Please make all the old age jokes you like, my man. <laughs> I'll take them. I'll take them today for that wonderful contribution. Uh, and please know the Streamlabs are up. The Super Chats, please keep sending them through and uh, you know uh, answer all your questions or whatever you put up there and uh, throughout the course of the show, for sure. You know how it works for those of you who've been watching Mornings with the Outlaw for quite some time now. And for those of you who are new and taking a chance on this show, thank you so much. Maybe you want to hear what I got to say about Dune or uh, the James Gunn comments. We'll talk about that. I didn't put Sam Ray me in the thumbnail or in the title but we'll talk about that and maybe some of you all get that as a bonus if you're interested to hear uh my thoughts on sam Raimi stepping into this situation let's see who else we got in here uh and yeah i said andrew hale uh let's see uh matt marceau is in here good morning marie zambeno good morning again good to see you uh jason earhart is in here uh he said did i miss something 
Did they shave their heads? Yes, uh, Christian Harloff shaved his head yesterday uh, for uh, some donations and whatever. I don't know. Should I? I mean, I've got a lot of I got a lot of hair. I don't know if I should shave. I doubt I'd get the three grand he got. I think is what I heard. Uh, but maybe I get a little bit close to that. It would be a lot of fun uh, to see if there's a, enough there to shave uh, to shave my head off. Uh, let's see, Andrew Hale. Uh, good to see you uh, again in here. Level two trading. Hello. I haven't seen you in a couple of episodes good to see you again my man uh wiley todd is up in here and yes wiley answer to your facebook chat uh, message i was building the show when you sent that in i have seen jeremiah johnson i thoroughly recommend it please watch it if you can uh let's see nay nay whom heath says go rams thank you so much yes go rams uh queen queen george jim says good morning outlaw nation thank you good morning to you too jason Nearhart, little ball busting saying la has a football team hey we have two the rams and the chargers that should let you know what's up. Ronnie Padilla, how are you? Oh, uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, Wiley Todd sent in a, a Streamlabs uh, reference, or Super Chat, rather, referencing what I just referenced uh, with Jeremiah Johnson. Let me bring it up for him. I don't want to miss it when he uh, – because Roka just watched Jeremiah Johnson for the first time. Last night, loved every minute of it. Of it your thoughts of it. I like it a lot. It's a great – uh, film and if you look at Jeremiah Johnson and juxtapose it with All Is Lost, it's two different Robert Red film, Redford films, but both of them about being out in a a version of wilderness, uh, with Jeremiah Johnson out there in the wilderness himself and quietly doing his thing, and All Is Lost in the wilderness of the sea and quietly doing his thing. So it's an interesting, both those films are companion pieces, in my opinion, as a younger Robert Redford and an older Robert Redford kind of tackling the elements of his world within the both of those movies. So yes, highly recommend that Jeremiah Johnson. And please, now you can use the meme or the gif that they use with uh, Robert Redford and Jeremiah Johnson uh, with some knowledge about where that gif uh, has come from. Uh, <clears throat> all right, let's see, Hugo Chavez is in here. Thank you very much. Let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, Andrew Hill says uh, Doreen is probably asleep. She has a show at 3 p.m. Uh, we'll see. Darren Wright's in here, of course. Ben Rayner, good to see you. Uh, Jake Yacoveta, yes, Jake, uh, as he said right there. And I'm doing this through uh, Streamlabs today. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm doing this through StreamYard today. Uh, kind of figured out how to be able to bring up uh, pictures and things of that nature a little more uh, fluidly. Uh, uh, here he goes. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up button, share, and subscribe if you haven't. Absolutely. Always good to get the likes uh, going as high. We got about 60 you all starting out here hopefully we'll get above to 150 close to 200 by the end of the show in terms of viewers but please hit that like button when you can uh, i'd appreciate you swinging that cursor over just hitting the like and then uh you know keep on watching the show keep on doing you my man uh seeing the belt and the mask absolutely rick's always sitting right behind me the belt and mask uh, no doubts no doubts always there hanging out with me but, uh, you know, this might be one of the last few shows we do in, in this version of The Office. I am going to be transitioning into our uh, what used to be our meditation room. Uh, it's gonna it's a tighter office, but I think it's going to be better and more conducive for the content I want to create here and for the look of uh, the Outlaw Nation show that we want to do uh, here, or the Outlaw Nation, rather, that I want to uh, put up here uh, for people to consume on YouTube. So it's going to be a lot of fun making that transition over the next week. going to take some time waiting for that desk to come in. You know, nowadays, deliveries take a little bit of time so once i get that desk and build it it's going to be in there and i'll have the outlaw poster which is already in there now uh and a couple other posters hopefully that i'll put up maybe some of you all want to suggest some posters i can get that are kick-ass that are cool maybe superhero based maybe classic film based things of that nature another show that i'm considering that's for sure uh looking at is uh is a show called i want to do the criterion corner which is about a 15 minute uh pre-produced show where I just talk about one uh, uh, one fi one film from the Criterion Collection that's available for you to purchase, uh, and you guys can like maybe get oh, be aware of some classic films to balance out the other stuff uh, that I'm doing here on the channel as well. You know, I always want to keep my toes connected to uh, classic films, to films of the uh, foreign films, things of that nature that I really enjoy and are a part of my love. Of cinema overall and maybe some of you will be uh you know kind of hip to it. maybe some of you will be awoken to some uh, titles you wouldn't have considered before uh from watching those shows we shall see uh down the road and that'll just be a pre-produced show not a live show yes yeah dan lace in the new outlaw cave yeah absolutely 
uh, certainly something uh, that we are putting together. And uh, my girlfriend can take this office back because this was originally set up for her to start shooting her photography and you know, like building her business. And now that she's in this position where she's moving towards that goal, I want to clear out the space here so that she can shoot whatever she needs to shoot in here because I certainly can do what I need to do in there. Tried it out a little bit last or last week or a couple weeks ago. Tried it a few shows out there. Felt comfortable. We just have to move the couch from that section into this office, and then I'll have space to put the desk in and my beloved chair uh, to do my thing. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, Matt Marceau, already on board with it. Sounds cool. A lot of great Kurosawa in the Criterion Collection. Absolutely. I saw James Bangold last night. He was tweeting about Ugetsu, which is a fantastic Japanese film as well in the Criterion Collection. Uh, and hopefully by doing this, I have a little bit of nefarious me uh, goals in this in that I want to have um uh i want to have uh what do you i want to have criterion notice that i'm doing this and maybe they'll start sending me the copies of their movies before they come out so i can review them on the channel we shall see um and i know uh people over at uh, the hyper rpg people are doing have doing a version of this themselves but i have had this idea for quite some time so i want to do my version of it but it's one title per episode so we shall see so you know i always have thoughts i always have thoughts for content creating stuff and uh, things of that nature so uh thank you all so much again for joining me we're up to about 81 people here uh this morning about 41 likes please swing that cursor over uh, button cursor over and hit that like button i'd appreciate it and if you haven't subscribed to the channel you've been hesitating to subscribe to the channel like ferris muthana who finally subscribed last night to the channel even though he'd been on the channel multiple times i brought him on the show's live he finally subscribed i guess i crossed some kind of line with him where it was okay for him to finally subscribe to the channel i would appreciate if you all hit us well hit went on down there and hit subscribe uh as well i want to give some love to the people who have subscribed already before we start the show gabby max subscribed uh uh over the over uh about 18 minutes ago uh chuck uh, a guy named chuck has subscribed blair gamble subscribed a few hours ago uh and let's see during uh yeah yeah and during the uh during the show itself last night People subscribe. Tack Peters, Yafrin Faro, Alvin Bowie Jr., Jeremy Sh uh, Sh Sh Shibasu, Clay Caleb Overton, uh, Swim Psych, and Nasir Nasir all subscribed to the channel. So please, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, feel free to do so now. Uh, you know, as we march towards the uh, twenty thousand uh, subscribers goal here on the Outlaw Nation channel, be a part of the nation. Join the nation and do that. And of course, don't forget the Outlaw Nation podcast network is now live. All the best shows, all the greatest shows I have here on the network go on to the podcast network. I just put up uh, the uh, Strong Style, which is our latest episode. We tackle the 1997 match between DDP and Mandy, uh, Randy uh, Macho Man Savage at uh, WCW's Spring Stampede. We talk about that, get into that, break down how that kind of changed the trajectory of DDP's career and put him in contention for titles. And also uh, the, uh, we share a heartwarming story between DDP and Randy Savage out of the ring that they shared with each other. Fantastic story. We talk about all of that. And of course, the top 10 <clears throat> is a new episode of the top 10 that has come out, top 10 podcast. Matt Nost and I doing our thing we talk we break down the top 10 one hit directors that's right a one hit wonder directors as the directors who got one hit but couldn't quite repeat it no matter how many times they tried so we do that that's available you can look in the description of this video and see that as well uh, all right uh, let's see we got a, a, a super chat that came in from larry lee he says question from mk songbird any thoughts on the mandalorian docuseries announcement starting may 4th yeah here are my thoughts Woo i'm excited that sounds awesome i love it uh people really loved that uh, rise of skywalker doc that came out people actually like that doc more than the actual movie i found that to be interesting as well so but i think because i think people for the most part people loved mandalorian i think this documentary will just be additional material to make you fall more in love with the mandalorian and look forward to season two uh coming scheduled still in october of this year on Disney Plus. So I'm excited to see this uh, docuseries and, uh, you know, kind of see it all broken down. You get probably more time with John Favreau, more time uh, with uh, Pedro Pascal, more time with uh, Gina Carano, with everybody involved in the Giancarlo Esposito, everybody involved in this, see how they went about shooting it, how they went about putting the costumes together, uh, the locations, all that stuff. Uh, maybe they'll address some of the complaints of fans had with a couple of the casting decisions. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Cannavale and Miss uh, Amy Sedaris, maybe there'll be some addressing of that. I'm sure there's going to be a boatload of baby Yoda. So there'll be a lot of that rolling through as well. <clears throat> 
So we'll shall see. Uh, let's see, uh, Christian Alante, how much to shave your head, Roka? Well, listen, if Christian did it for three grand, I, maybe I can do it for two grand. I'd be happily, uh, happily shave my head for two grand. Uh, that'll at least pay rent for a month. So why not? Uh, it'd be kind of fun. So we shall see. <laughs> Larry Lee says every current jam must shave their head. No, no, no. Come on. Dan already shaved his head. I love, you know, it's a it's a shame uh, Bateman doesn't have a title because it'd be kind of fun to see what he would do if he shaved his head. So uh, there it is. Uh, Big Chuck 420 says, good morning. Whoop, whoop, outlaw. Thank you so much, Big Chuck. Appreciate you joining me this morning. All right, let's get into the crux of everything. Let me bring up some pictures and let's start talking about this massive, massive uh, 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 um a uh, load of pictures that have, that were dropped for uh, Dune uh, from Denis Villeneuve that's coming in December right now, scheduled to come out in December of this year. Could get pushed, but for right now, it is still scheduled to come out in December. Let's take, that first, let's take a look at the first picture here, and that is right there. Look at that. Fantastic stuff uh, here. Vanity Fair did a, fantastic, did a great breakdown of what is going to be happening with Dune, what's, uh, what's going on with it, what, is, what it's going to look like with some of these pictures, uh, and what uh, Denis had to say about the making of this movie and what his intentions are uh, with adapting of the book. Let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, Frank Herbert's Dune is about uh, a young royal named Paul Atreides. That's who Timothy Chalamet, who you see there in the picture with Rebecca Ferguson, who is playing his mom. Uh, Timothy is playing Paul Atreides, who prepares to leave the comfortable life he knows for a desolate, dangerous mining planet known as Arrakis, Arrakis where his wealthy family will oversee extraction of a spice vital to the galaxy his native planet uh, that's uh, paul atreides native planet is caledon that is uh, where he is at uh, and the book it's based on came out in 1965 it influenced star wars it influenced a bunch of sci-fi stuff uh herbert wasn't always happy with some of the influences uh, from uh, that george lucas took from his book but hey that's how it goes you know someone takes your ideas and becomes way more successful with it making billions of dollars that could maybe get under your skin a little bit but in this article here they talk about that they shot in southern jordan uh they also shot in abu dhabi so you know on it kind of shades of uh star wars as well a lot of people looking at these pictures uh they were a little miffed at the um kind of sandy look at them or whatever which is kind of weird to me because i have always kind of just connected sand to uh frank herbert's dune and the dune series because it didn't just Dune. there was a bunch of sequels and prequels and stuff that came out as well and i used to manage a bookstore and i remember almost all the covers had something to do with sand or the sand worms and things of that nature yeah even more sand here uh you know thing uh, there we go uh, uh from uh, another uh actress and character in uh the film which i will talk about in just a second but a lot of people are talking about this shot this shot uh i saw boss logic put uh um kylo ren's lightsaber uh, in his uh, in uh, Chalamet's hand, which I thought was brilliant, and put some. I think he put some uh, um, uh, Star Wars uh, ships behind him in this shot. This is a very Star Warsy shot. I get it. People are saying, "Oh, the comparisons, blah blah blah." I get it. I get it. But it doesn't mean that Denis can't put his own spin on it. And I think Denis is going to put an incredible spin on this thing. But a lot of people seem to complain, be complaining that these pictures don't necessarily convey a lot of fun. And I don't know if I agree. This is Denis Villeneuve. He's a contemplative filmmaker. Uh, Sicario, you would argue Sicario is the most action-packed film he's ever directed, and yet it is still a contemplative film. Uh, so Many Prisoners, a contemplative film. Enemy, the same thing. Blade Runner 2049, Arrival. These are all contemplative films so he's going to have you know this approach to it that's a little bit different than people expect we see here oscar isaac and josh brolin in these still suits and wearing the armor uh that they're going to uh, be involved in here josh brolin and uh, jason momoa who we just saw for a second here they're the ones that are going to be training paul in the in a certain fighting technique so we'll see how that uh goes down but i want to bring up josh brolin again looking at the armor here you know this is a part of the still suits but they wear the armor the armor being from the house uh, that they all are involved in. Look at the logo uh, back there. Pretty kick-ass logo. You see Chalamet there on the left. You know, uh, Oscar Isaac in here, Rebecca Ferguson, Josh Brolin, Jason Momoa out, on, out in front. So these pictures are pretty badass. Uh, I, I enjoyed them very much. Uh, and seeing what we have, what uh, what is on offer from Denis Villeneuve uh, and Legendary for this film. Another uh, badass picture of Rebecca Ferguson, who is, uh, you know, quickly becoming a go-to actress for a lot of things. Um, 
<clears throat> of course, we got Zendaya in here. Uh, she looks fantastic uh, in her character, a mystery character uh, in this uh, film. And, uh, you know, just to jump on that, she also uh, put up uh, a new picture of herself in social media. So two different uh, pictures of uh, Zendaya as this character uh, and looking pretty cool. Uh, by the way, shout out to her having 67 million followers. Lord almighty. I'm trying to get above 35,000. And this incredibly talented young lady has 67 million followers. Shout out to her uh, for her, uh, you know, her just continued dominance of things. By the way, uh, we got a little greatest showman situation when you got little Zendaya and Rebecca Ferguson. Will they will there be any musical, any songs broke out into? No, no, there won't be. So I guess I could put that uh, dream or that wish away for now. But let's let's go back to that first picture. I want to give a little more background on this situation here. Uh, humans are the aliens in Arrakis. The dominant species on that world are immense, voracious sandworms that burrow through the barren drifts like subterranean dragons uh in this article from vanity fair chalamet talks about how hot it was that he would leave his uh, uh place his room at 2 a.m and it's 100 degrees they were shooting in up to 120 degrees in some for some days uh, for some scenes while wearing these steel suits that were thick rubbery armor that preserves the body's moisture even gathering tiny bits from the breath exhaled through the nose in the story, the suits are supposed to be life-giving because they turn all that moisture or that your body naturally produces from the sweat, even peeing, whatever, have, and they turn it into a way to like, kind of keep your body nourished uh, in uh, that way. So um, let's see here. There was an uh, early adaptation uh, of the of the film of the uh, novel that was going to be filmed by uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky back in the seventies that never quite uh, found its way. And if you know Jodorowsky's films, it would have been a wild dune to. See say the least uh also david lynch did one in the 80s uh, it was okay it wasn't uh, it's you know there's a cult feeling to it i'm not a big fan of it but i know there are some people who are kyle mclaughlin sting in that one max von Sydow, uh in that one as well there was a mini series on the sci-fi channel um that was part of this uh, uh that uh, did a version of dune as well i think mini series is not a bad way to go to be honest with you if you want to capture everything that's happening with dune and, and getting on top of everything that's going on so certainly interesting stuff going on uh, with uh within the story of dune so if you want to capture that all of that i think a mini series is the way because obviously you have way more hours to put all the different twists and turns and characters and stories because a lot of people compare this to game of thrones as well uh beowulf is something that people have saw as an influence for uh, this novel um, in that way. And the Roman Empire, how the Roman Empire was handled, that's kind of how uh, uh, people view or saw a historical context for uh, what Frank Herbert was doing in Dune uh, in that original novel. Uh, next big rap star, 92, says, Hi, Roka, what's going down? I appreciate it. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, let's see. Jodorowsky's uh, Dune documentary is great. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't seen this documentary, there's a great documentary out there uh, from Alejandro Jodorowsky. I mean, about Alejandro. Andro Jodorowsky's approach to doing Dune. It is a wild ride, that documentary, for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, the day, uh, Donick says the documentary was great. Yeah, so if you haven't watched that documentary, absolutely take a look at that documentary and see if you like it or not. Uh, all right, just want to make sure. Uh, yeah, okay, covering everything here. All right, just want to jump back into the story. Here, give you a little more, uh, a little more of the quotes here from Denis Villeneuve. He said, I would not agree to make this adaptation of the book with one single movie the world is too complex it's a world that takes its power in detail see so just like i said a few seconds ago the mini series is the way to go because there's so much involved in here one of the biggest uh, reasons people felt this book was so difficult to translate into film is because there are so many characters there are so many houses and twists and turns within the book and it seems very extensive uh and very layered and complex no different than a game of thrones book and and game of thrones turned those into a whole series multiple seasons of a series whereas dune is trying to do this now what, what uh, uh denied reveals here in the uh in the interview uh, with Vanity Fair, that he is doing two movies. So the uh, the we're only going to get the first half uh, of the book or the first half of the story in this movie that's coming out in December, and then the next movie will be the rest of the remainder of the story. So he's breaking this novel up into two separate movies. This is an interesting commitment uh, to the situation because if this movie comes out and doesn't do well, and I saw some people already worried about that it might bomb or it might not do that well. 
it, it's a situation uh, where that could be a problem as uh, uh, down the road because then are people going to be excited to see a part two of this thing if the first one kind of flops? And remember, Blade Runner 2049 did flop. Uh, I have my reasons for that. It's not like the first Blade Runner was a, you know, was a box office hit. It wasn't. So it could just be a niche kind of a situation. Hopefully that isn't the situation here with Dune, that it's not a niche type of project or, or film in that way. And that will be interesting to see uh, as this goes along. Some more more background on the characters here, that uh, uh, on the character that uh, Timothy Chalamet is playing. For those of you who haven't read the book, Paul Atreides uh, is a boy struggling to find his place in the world, but he possesses the ability to change it. He has a supernatural gift to harness and unleash energy, lead others, and meld with the heart of his new home world. He comes from a powerful galactic, fa galactic family, the house Atreides. Um, and his mother and father, uh, played by Oscar Isaac, he plays uh, Duke Leto. That is his father, uh, uh, Timothy Chalamet's father. And of course, as I just mentioned earlier, Rebecca Ferguson playing Lady Jessica. That is his mom in this. Um, and uh, they get involved uh, and battle um, a criminal, a criminal uh, house, uh, House Harkonnen. Uh, they're led by the uh, uh, villainous Baron Vladimir. I think that's the part that Max von Sydow played in uh, the 1980s version of it, but this time around we get Stellan Skarsgård, uh, and this is a, they made some adjustments. And in, in, in the Vanity Fair article, they talk about some of the adjustments they made to the characters here. Uh, for example, to start with the Baron, uh, he is created with full body prosthetics. He's like a rhino in human form. Uh, that gives me an unfortunate uh, uh, remembrance of uh, Paul Giamatti as Rhino in human form or a hu human in Rhino form uh, in that uh, Spider Amazing Spider-Man uh, movie, which was horrible. But this sounds a little bit different. He said the version of the character is less of a madman as he is in the book and more of a predator. Uh, Villeneuve says, as much as I deeply love the book, I felt that the Baron was flirting very often with caricature. And I tried to bring him a bit more dimension. That's why I brought in Stellan. Uh, Stellan Skarsgård has something in the eye. You feel that there's someone thinking, thinking, thinking that is tension and is calculating inside deep in the eyes. I can testify it can be quite frightening. Certainly, we've seen Stella Skarsgård play uh, uh, villainous roles. If you haven't seen um, his uh, Insomnia, the original version of Insomnia, not the Pacino remake, the American remake, but the original version of Insomnia, there are some evil moments from Stellan Skarsgård in that movie, and he has played uh, some good villains in the past. He's also played goofy guys like he does in the Thor series, so he's, his, his ability to play status up and down the uh, ladder is fantastic. So seeing him step in, we've seen him play villains. We just did Hunt for Red October uh, in uh, on the cinema files and certainly a young uh, time in his career he is playing kind of a villain in the movie going after sean connery so we've seen him do this many times i'm looking forward to see what he can do with this character especially when they're looking at it as a predator and not a madman so that makes it even more unsettling and certainly we've seen that from a number of our world leaders lately uh, over the last few years so wouldn't be surprised to see that uh, feel a little more resonant in this version also there's more to do with lady jessica that's paul's mother that's rebecca ferguson's character she's a member of this uh, sect of women called bene gesserit they can read minds control people with their voices uh kind of shades of umbrella academy uh, from that character in umbrella academy um <clears throat> And uh, the article points out that this is, again, a precursor to the Jedi mind trick. So maybe there is some influence there as well. They manipulate the balance of power in the universe. Uh, Villeneuve uh, mentions uh, that uh, in the script that he wrote with Eric Roth and John Spates, that she's even more fearsome than you've seen her before in any other version, including the book. Uh, she is a warrior priestess. So now she is almost, it sounds like how they're describing her in other articles, that she's essentially like Linda Hamilton in that she knows she has to train her son and get her son ready for what he's going. Linda Hamilton, Terminator 2, rather. Uh, she has to train her son to get him ready for what he has to do or what he's got to take on. And in the past, in other versions and in the book, she's a way less hands on on then I, it sounds like Villeneuve wants to make her in the movie uh, so it's going to be good because uh, I mean you don't cast someone like Rebecca Ferguson and, and put her on the sidelines it doesn't make sense which is one of the issues I had with Mission Impossible Fallout they kind of didn't let her kick as much ass as she should have kicked ass uh, like she did when she did in Rogue Nation, you know, so that was uh, one of my issues. So I like that they're going to give or Denis Villeneuve is going to give Rebecca more to do in this movie because she's an incredible actress, a magnetic actress. You want to see her kick a little ass or at least teach 
her boy how to kick a little ass. Uh, she has a greater role in defending and training Paul, too, it says here. She's a mother. Uh, Rebecca says this. This is her quotes, Rebecca Ferguson. She's a mother. She's a concubine. She's a soldier. Deneen was very respectful of Frank's work in the book, but the quality of the arcs for much of the women have been brought up to a new level. There were some shifts he did, and they are beautifully portrayed now. So that's good quotes from uh, Rebecca Ferguson, excited to take on this role. Uh, another change from the book uh, uh, into the movie is uh, that the character um, Dr. Leet Kynes, the leading ecologist on Arrakis, uh, an independent power broker, uh, who is usually played or depicted as a white man, is now being played by Sharon Duncan Brewster, who we saw in Rogue One. She is a black woman, black actress, taking on this role. She had something to say about it. She said, what Denis had started, stated to me, and let me bring up that picture of her so you guys understand what I'm talking about. There it goes. Uh, she said, what um, what Denis stated, had stated to me was that there was a lack of female characters in this cast, and he had always been very feminist, pro-women, and wanted to write the role for a woman, this human being manages to basically keep the peace amongst many people. Women are very good at that. So why can't Kynes be a woman? Why shouldn't Kynes be a woman? Uh, very fun stuff there uh, from uh, uh, Sharon Duncan Brewster, who I enjoyed in Rogue One. Not a big part, but certainly uh, an enjoyable part to see her in that. So uh, great to see her taking on even more uh, roles here in uh, this particular uh, version of Dune. Uh, let me see what else we've got to say about it, give you more background on this. Uh, there's, uh, they said there's a vast menagerie of other characters. The humans are called Mentats, which are augmented. There are humans, sorry, called Mentats, which are augmented with computer-like minds. As I mentioned earlier, earlier, Jason Momoa, Josh Brolin are two warriors who train Paul as well. Uh, Duncan Idaho is who uh, Jason Momoa plays, and Gurney Halleck is Josh Brolin. Also, Dave Batista is part of the cast, as people already know. He plays uh, a sinister enforcer named Glossu Robin, who is obviously a rabbin uh, who's underneath uh, Max von Sydow's character. Under, I'm sorry, uh, Stella Skarsgård's character under the Baron's character. And Charlotte Rampling has a role as Bene Gesserit, uh, the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother. So she's in charge of this whole sect of women. Uh, and from what I understand from the book, um, Rebecca Ferguson's character is sent to uh, uh, to have a child uh, with uh, Oscar Isaac's character. They were expecting it to be a woman, but it ends up being a son, and they have to adapt their plans from that point forward. Also, Javier Bardem is the leader of the Freeman tribe uh, as Stilgar. Uh, and this Freeman tribe, from those of you who saw the 80s movie, that was Kyle MacLachlan's character. So we have Javier Bardem now stepping in. And Zendaya's character is a mystery woman named Chani who haunts Paul in his dreams as a vision with glowing blue eyes. Uh, uh, Denis kind of finished out the article by saying it's a book that tackles politics, religion, ecology, spirituality, and with a lot of characters. I think that's why it's so difficult. Honestly, it's by far the most difficult thing I've done in my life. Um, and I am excited to see this from him because he's smart about his approach. This idea of breaking up into two movies, I think is brilliantly how it's supposed to be done. Whether it works or not, We'll see in the long run. But like It, It Chapter 1, It Chapter 2. Yeah, It Chapter 2 wasn't as good as It Chapter 1. Still enjoyable to watch, in my opinion, but not as good as It Chapter 1. But if you're going to tackle a mammoth opus like It, it's smart to break it up into two films. And I think the same thing here. If you're going to tackle a mammoth opus like Dune and give it its due once and for all and not turning into a cult film or not turning into a... Uh, less than stellar uh, TV series from sci-fi, you want to do as much as possible to bring out the elements of the book that are interesting and bring people back to discover this book for multiple generations. I mean, this book still sells out. This book is still very popular. People still buy Dune and read it and, and enjoy it and talk about it and the subsequent sequels and what have you. So I think this is a smart approach to it overall. It's a risky approach, certainly, like I said, if the first film doesn't do so well, it's not like Denis has been blowing up the door off the box office with a lot of his films but if it doesn't if it doesn't do well there's a chance but if it does do well then you know the potential to make more money off this when the sequel comes out well not sequel but the continuation comes out is a, a positive overall for both the studio and the director himself one more thing about the still suits uh what these guys are wearing let me bring that up again i want to make sure you guys have a good picture of what i'm talking about that's look at look at that beard my god 
Oscar Isaac, man. He makes you want to bite your lip, that's for sure. Little Star Wars reference there. Yeah, he looks fantastic. But anyway, he says, uh, the, uh, sorry, the still suits are um, these form-fitting suits that are designed to protect the wearer from the sun and sand while conserving as much moisture as humanly possible. Everything from sweat to urine to breath is collected, filtered, and deposited into pockets the wearer can drink from. Uh, let's see. And they talk about the suits do not smell great, and that's mentioned in the book as well. The sill suits designed by the native Freeman population are considered to be the best. As it said, they're able to recycle all but a thimble full of water per day. And uh, uh, IGN kind of took a look at these still suits and said that they, uh, from to what it looks like to them, that the design of the suits are uh, sticking fairly close to the example set by David Lynch's 1984 movie, uh, except this, uh, these suits are a little more organic in quality and lighter in tone. Uh, they were, uh, uh, it's a dark gray instead of the full black that we saw in uh, David Lynch's Dune. Uh, also, some of the new images show characters like Javier Bardem Stilgar wearing turbans and shrouds, likely a nod to the idea that Freeman are meant to be distant descendants of the nomadic Bedouin tribes from Earth. Yeah, that's another thing to know about Dune. This happens thousands of years in the future uh, after humans have gone to populate other planets uh, and be a part of the galaxy in uh, more extensive ways and things of that nature. So it is very human-based, human-oriented thousands of years in the future <clears throat> and still having something to say and do in the galaxy for sure. Uh, let's see, a little more about the house, Atreides. Uh, let's see, let's see. the uniforms are kind of look uh, with the armor, which is what Oscar Isaac is wearing there. It's very close to the uh, uh, to what we saw in the Lynch film. Uh, let's see, the new scene, let's see, the new, new movie seems to be drawing inspiration as well. The Atreides members are shown wearing dark military uniforms with very little in the way of ornamentation. Uh, we're at, we haven't seen too much from the house Harkonnen uh, look, and maybe that'll be the next drop crop of photos that drop is a little more of Stellan Skarsgård's side of things, see what they look like as well. <clears throat> the armor can be worn over the still suits and provide even greater protection when the members of the family venture outside their castle. Another thing that you have to know about uh, background about this uh, uh, book and the combat and the fighting styles within the book, uh, people ask, where are the guns? There are guns in the in the Dune universe. They're known as Lay's guns, um, but they're mostly reserved for ordinary infantrymen. That's interesting. Nobles instead tend to fight hand-to-hand -hand or with knives in ritualistic duels. And this is because the humanity has developed a deep distrust of technology in the Dune universe, kind of a la the Romulans in uh, the most recent uh, first season of Picard. This idea of having questions about technology, technology turning on people, things of that nature. So automatic weapons have been outlawed. Even traditional computers have mostly been replaced by conditioned humans known as Mentats, who I mentioned earlier. They have computer-like minds. Uh, however, the lack of ranged weapons in these images is also because Lay's guns are incredibly risky weapons when aimed at the wealthy elite. Pretty much anyone with enough wealth and resources in this universe wears a personal shield on their clothing. These shields don't deflect Lay's gun blasts. They actually detonate in a powerful explosion that kills the wearer, their assassin, and anything else in the surrounding, surrounding area. So essentially, these shields are being used on people's bodies as a system of mutually assured destruction. So um, I think that's a way to kind of keep it modern or keep it both uh, tied to the past and still set in the future this idea of hand-to-hand -hand combat this idea of you know knife uh, knife combat things of that nature um let's see paul eventually teaches oh yeah many members of the treatise family include uh including timothy chalamet's paul are experts in a form of martial arts known as the weirding way uh paul eventually teaches the weirding way to the freeman who is being led of course by javier bardem transforming them into the deadliest fighting force the galaxy has ever seen. Uh, the movie also introduces a weapon called a weirding module where Paul and his allies can channel their voice into destructive energy waves, but it remains to be seen if the new movie will include that particular element. So a lot to, uh, to digest here uh, in this particular, uh, uh, in this particular uh, uh, article and in the subsequent uh, analysis from other websites about these looks and about the, uh, uh, the remake of this film and about the uh, David Lynch film and how it compares and also what elements from the book we're going Going to see. Um, I, I, what do you all think? I, I, I haven't seen. Uh, let me see. Do I have, have I had any super chats? 
uh, roll through here. Any Streamlabs uh, for you guys? Any questions you guys want to uh, have about this whole thing? I've got, uh, what, over 100 y'all in here? What's what we got? Oh, oh, just about 100 y'all in here uh, and about 79 likes. Swing that thing. Yeah, swing that thing over. Give it a like. Uh, I'd appreciate it. Garth McBurney said, it looks cool, but no sting in a leather bathing suit. Yes, I hope no sting in a leather bathing suit. I'm actually very cool with that. No sting in a leather bathing suit. Uh, I'm actually very happy not to see that, Garth. No offense. Uh, Tim Franco says, he's I'm a dune sweaty. Uh, did I get anything wrong, Tim? Anything you want to correct uh, for me, my man? Uh, I feel like I got I covered most of anything uh, in this. Um, let's see. Aaliyah won't be in part one, so she isn't cast. I'm guessing this movie will end with the Harkonnens returning to Arrakis. So there we go. Uh, I don't think this. Oh, yeah. He's saying, I don't think this image is still suit. This is House of Treatise armor. Right. But they're wearing the still suits underneath, Tim. They're, the, uh, I imagine the still. Uh, let's see. I imagine the still suits are. Where is it? Uh, is, uh, this is probably the still suits uh, or something that they're wearing there. But underneath, if you look at Josh Bro, underneath there, they wear. I think they're wearing the armor over the still suits. That's what the article seems to be implying, brother. So I think that's what's uh, going on there. Uh, let's see what else Tim had to say. Cause I want to give Tim props as a sweaty that he is about this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> rolling through here. Uh, no, no, that was Everett McGill. He's talking about, uh, yeah, let's see. Oh, he is the Baron's nephew. Is that, uh, is that, uh, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, uh, hey, Roka, Atreides is pronounced Atreides, Atreides, Atreides. Okay. Atreides. Okay, cool um let's see if i've got anything else wrong i want to make sure that everyone who is a massive uh, dune fan gets their due here i don't want to disrespect anybody that enjoys uh uh that uh what dune is political how dare you sir <laughs> right right uh people tim franco loving the score to the lynch films great by toto and brian eno uh certainly that's a, an incredible score um hey, this is funny uh, Bautista in this role fits like a glove <clears throat> For some of you who don't know, I've been going through um – how can I say this? I've been going through what we do in the shadows because season two, I think, drops today, starts today. And uh, I ripped through season one. I'm almost done. I'm about, I got about two episodes left of season one over the last couple of days. Uh, it's such a damn good show, and I'm loving it. And it's so funny that Dave Bautista does uh, one does a role. He plays a role in episode seven, which has all these vampires you've seen in films before uh, be part of this council. Uh, some of them can't show up, but they make references to them. So this is very funny. Dave Batista is one of these guys that they've had in prison for like 90 years. Uh, and he talks to the main vampires when they're coming in to be tried for something they did. And so it was just so funny to see Dave Batista in this uh, uh, in this situation. Uh, what's this level two training? Says, damn it, damn it, Roca. Uh, what did I say? Did I say something wrong? Uh, did I uh, get into any kind of problems? What's this? Uh, what's the RIP? Uh, what's the RIP? Did someone say? Oh yeah, they said. Uh, I didn't see it. anybody. Uh, I want to make sure I didn't get any kind of anything's wrong here. Make sure. All right, Patrick Stewart was in the original one as well. Yes, I forgot about that. Thank you, Draws. I appreciate you clearing that up for me. Uh, he was in the original one. That's right. Uh, okay, let's see if there, if any new comments from Tim. Making sure I don't get it uh, wrong in here. Do 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 do. No, no, uh, no. I uh, got a morning roga from Joel from Compton. Thank you so much, Joel. Appreciate you uh, tagging along um let's see wiley toss is doing i'm so excited for this movie started reading the book all right good luck good luck with that uh while it's going to take you a while that's for sure yeah garth and an interesting comment i hope they use a patch of some practical effects for the sandworms and not cgi yeah that'd be kind of fun as well i agree um jose fonseca says i dig the middle eastern vibe of the novel yeah certainly a combo of that uh, Middle Eastern with Western uh, approaches and Western sensibilities against a Middle Eastern backdrop, for sure. Interesting that Faith Rutha, uh, Rutha isn't cast. Faith Rutha isn't cast. Yeah, I may. I mean, I don't think they're going to do everything. So uh, that's going to be maybe, or maybe they're going to move that character into the second, in the continuation, into the second movie. Tim, it's certainly something to keep an eye on. Uh, what we do in the shadows, TV show is incredible. Thank you, Tim. Yes, he also said that Stuart is in the Brolin role. So okay, Stuart was the Brolin role. So there we go. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. As you know, Howard, the real question is, does this movie get pushed into 2021? WB could be looking at the Oscar landscape. I think Dune has a greater shot if they don't move. Thoughts? Yeah, certainly possible. I mean, hold on. This is something that we talked about last night. 
we do uh, on the Hollywood Critics Association show that we that uh, Scott Menzel recently started. He's the head of Hollywood Critics Association. I'm very uh, thankful to be a member of them. I was on last night with uh, Wendy Lee and Jamie Philbrick and Scott. We were discussing this possibility of whether we will even have movies for the rest of 2020. I know they keep pushing that SpongeBob thing, like just kicking it down a week or two, thinking, hoping, hopefully, hoping, I mean, hoping it'll come out, but you don't know what's going to happen with that overall. And this situation here, I think, is fascinating on so many levels, too, because if this goes on as, as uh, these delays or these uh, keep uh, these postponements keep going throughout the year, we may not have an Oscar season, something Jeff and I, Jeff Snyder and I talked about a couple of weeks ago, and everyone was discussing whether all these movies are going to go down to streaming or digital uh, situations where the people can watch them and then vote for them. But massive epics like Dune, it just doesn't make any sense at all to drop that streaming at this point. You got to wait. And I don't know if they're going to uh, look at this thing for Oscar consideration. If they are, then you make a fantastic point. If movies don't come back and they got to push this thing, they will push this thing because they probably do have aspirations to win some kinds of awards or Oscar awards with this film, whether it be for acting, directing, overall film, certainly technical awards uh, they want to be in consideration for. That's for sure. Uh, oh, that's what it is. Now I got Paul Giamatti's rhino, st rhino stuck in my head. <laughs> All right. Well, I apologize for that. I'll absolutely apologize for that. Um can't wait is a uh, drunken prayer villeneuve is a great filmmaker dune definitely needs at least two parts to do it justice brilliant cast so far as well yeah i don't disagree with that at all all right what do we got over 100 y'all in here thank you so much for joining me here on the outlaw nation please swing that cursor over hit that like button uh give it some love uh in that way and uh let's see i've got some uh, stream labs that have come through over the last few minutes let me uh, jump into them first killix said harloff shaved his head on monday showed it on air for a thousand dollars and brett shared and apparently shaved his head yesterday for another thousand dollars and is showing it today how much would it take to shave your head um all right let's put the you know i think i have better hair than sheridan and uh, harloff so i would put it the rate at two thousand dollars uh as i said earlier two thousand dollars i'll happily shave my head uh and it'd have to be Streamlabs uh, two thousand dollars not super chat because super chat they take 33 percent, which is stream which when with stream labs they don't take any of that money so uh yeah i would take about two thousand dollars for that to happen king nirvana 24 wants to know have you watched the dark side of the ring last night i have not no i'm watching that after i'm done here with mornings with yellow i'm gonna go and uh, watch that uh, jimmy snooker uh, episode of dark side of the ring and then aaron turner and i are going to do a review of that uh, later on uh, for Friday. And by the way, we dropped our new episode, as I mentioned earlier in the show. So please uh, take a look at that as well. <clears throat> uh, Kellex goes, do you think if the first Dune movie bombs at the box office, they would just release the second film on digital or just take the loss and release it in theaters anyway and hope for the best? I think they'll absolutely release it in theaters and hope for the best because there's possibility that that second film could be better than the first film. We're going to get to that in just a second with James Gunn in a little bit rather. Uh, so the possibility could exist that the second film is better than the first film because uh, a lot of people, if you look at trilogies, and I know this is not a trilogy, but if you look at trilogies, a lot of people kind of enjoy that second film a little bit more than the first film, right? Empire Strikes Back, they like it more than the first uh, uh, first Star Wars. Uh, Terminator 2, like it more than the first Terminator. You know, things like Wrath of Khan, better than, uh, you know, the first original Star Trek movie. So uh, I think there's a possibility here where they uh, could do where this second film could be better than the first film in terms of box office, depending on the reviews and what have you. But I imagine they will release it no matter what, just to see if they can recoup anything for it. Uh, let's see. Sorry, y'all. Hmm. Uh, okay, Andrew G. Donnelly said, I can't wait for Denise Dune. I've never read the novel, but I'm familiar with the original film. I loved uh, Blade Runner 2049. He's a tremendous director, and the cast is great. I like splitting into two parts, too, if he thinks it's the best way to tell the story. Clearly, he does, and Denis would know. I mean, I think you don't uh, hire someone like Denis and his expertise and his knowledge and his abilities as a filmmaker and 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 like handicap him into trying to shove all those elements into one movie. Uh, I think you let him, uh, you know, take his time with it and let it breathe. He did the same thing. Uh, I mean, Peter Jackson did the same thing with the Lord of the Rings movies, right? Each one of those movies had a chance to breathe within them. And then there was the extended cuts, which people really enjoyed as well. Yeah, people have an issue with The Hobbit that he kind of tried to extend a little too far out. But 
I like them film and there's a lot, there's a number of us that like those films. So, uh, you know, I think, I still think he did a good job with it and we'll see what Denis does with this, but don't expect, you know, a, a rip roaring rousing film. This is going to be a very contemplative film leaning into the elements of politics, leaning into more of character work, more of these scenes that are probably going to be more like conversational scenes, more exploratory scenes. It's a film that's going to take its time. I think that's the number one thing you have to understand when you walk into a theater to see a De Denis Villeneuve film, settle in, go pee, go get your food, whatever, way ahead of time, come into the theater, sit, get into a comfortable position and enjoy the journey that Denis takes you on with his movies. Cause he does take you on fantastic journeys. In my opinion, I loved Blade Runner 2049s and, and Arrival and a number of his other films as well. Jake Yacovetta donated through Super Chat. He says, uh, Big Chuck 420, today is my son's 16th birthday. We are both huge fans. I think you I think you could give him a shout out. His name is Ryan Hawking. Thanks, Outlaw. Hold on a second. Let me get back on camera. Ryan Hawking, happy 16th birthday, son. Congratulations. You made it to 16. Uh, you are now, what, officially able to drive a car. So mad uh, mad respect to you, my man. Take it easy. Take it slow. Uh, don't leave the house unless you have to in this condition right now. But, you know, take a drive for an hour if you want. Have a little fun. Enjoy your freedom for a little bit. And uh, hopefully you got yourself a nice birthday cake, got yourself some cool presents uh, from your dad. Uh, but happy 16th birthday, my man. Um, enjoy what, you go, what you're going through, where you're at right now, and start, you know, start playing, start laying down some mini goals for yourself as you're getting a little bit older, walking out, you know, going to be graduating high school soon, I imagine. You're moving into college, possibly, or moving into the workforce, possibly. Have some cool goals for yourself. Kind of set them out, but don't forget to enjoy your life. Don't forget to find time to enjoy that movie, enjoy that song, enjoy uh, whatever it is that uh, makes you happy or helps you geek out or what have you. You know, you got to have balance in life. It isn't just going after things. You got to have moments to enjoy the world and uh, enjoy the people you've got in your world. So uh, congratulations to you, my man. Happy birthday uh, and look forward to many birthdays from you. And hopefully we'll be celebrating you on the Outlaw Nation for every year for years to come. That is the goal, certainly. So stick with me. I'll stick with you. Thank you so much. Uh, and shout out to you uh, as well there, uh, 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 Big Chuck 420. And let me bring it. Is it a super chat? Let me bring it up so everyone gets gets full credit here. I don't want to uh, not give full credit here to Big Chuck 420 and Jake for uh, putting that super chat in. Thank you, Jake, brother. Uh, so, yeah, big, big shout outs to them. Um, you're a fan of me. I'm a fan of you. That's for damn sure. So thank you so much. Uh, and much love to both of you guys. Uh, don't forget, the Streamlabs are up, so please send them in. There's the address right there. Send in any questions or any thoughts uh, that you want me to read out here on the show and uh, give my two cents on um, and uh, go from there. Also, the Super Chats are still up, but, you know, Super Chats take 33%, whereas Streamlabs lets you keep the whole money. So Streamlabs, for me, is the way uh, to uh, the way I prefer to go uh, in that way. Uh, let's see. What, someone put Khan. Khan is doing a virtual marketplace according to the rap. Yeah, I, I've been seeing this lately, these virtual comic cons. I, I don't get it, to be honest with you. Um, they're essentially just a series of interviews, aren't they? I mean, unless you're actually walking into a room to feel the vibe with everybody else uh, of a person on stage and feel the energy of the crowd, it's not really a comic con. Sorry. I, I, to me, in my opinion, I don't think a virtual comic con comes anywhere close to an actual comic con and so it's nice yeah you have these conversations but these are for projects that are going to be delayed and pushed back possibly and we might not see these projects till 2021 where you'll do where you'll do another comic con all over again hopefully uh, in uh, in rooms again in hall h and in all the ballroom 20 all that jazz uh and enjoy the the uh, these artists and creators speaking about their stuff all over again so it's weird to me overall um that i've heard junkets are being done uh over that makes sense to me at all because you're just interviewing somebody for five minutes or ten minutes whatever you're allowed to interview them for i think that's cool but virtual uh stuff is a little strange to me virtual comic cons virtual marketplaces things of that nature is a little weird to me uh you know because yeah they're essentially junkets in my opinion i'm not criticizing i know everyone's like adapting i'm just giving my point of view my perspective on it my opinion on it but i'm certainly not telling people not to do it i'm just saying in my opinion it feels a little a little weird so uh yeah well thanks uh jake Yagavetta says that new strong style intro video 
is great. Yeah, Jake, uh, let me publicly ask you for some overlays using those, using that graphic or using that. I've got pictures I can send you uh, from uh, the great Brian Ward who did that for me. Uh, and in fact, why don't we, uh, you know, uh, just indulge me. Why don't we take a look at it now? I think I brought it up. Here we go. That's the picture for the new uh, strong style uh, uh, situation there. And here's the video. Pretty cool stuff there, right? Pretty cool stuff. That's our pro wrestling show here on the Outlaw Nation channel. You can find it uh, there. Uh, uh, multiple episodes of Strong Style have been recorded over numerous weeks. So we revisit one classic wrestling match and have a little fun talking about it. All right, that's enough indulging me. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Uh, and Jake says, yeah, LL, yeah, just send me the logo. We'll do it, man. We'll do. Uh, you are awesome uh, to do all the things you do for uh, this channel. All right, we're running out of time. Uh, apparently that Dune conversation went on way longer than I anticipated. We got 25 minutes before before SCN Live starts. You know I don't want to step on Christian's toes. So let me finish up uh, uh, these last two stories. Sam Raimi has finally confirmed that he is doing uh, Doctor Strange 2. Uh, Sammy boy over there. There he is hanging out. Uh, and then you see, of course, Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange. Uh, this was a... Uh, he mentioned this when he that he was he mentioned that he's officially aboard the Doctor Strange sequel during a press junket for his upcoming Quibi horror anthology series, 50 States of Fright. Uh, this is from Cinema Blend. They attended this thing, uh, and uh, Doctor Strange threw a reference. Uh, you know, um, oh, oh, sorry. When the Doctor Strange reference uh, that was thrown into Spider-Man Two was mentioned, Raimi said the following. He said, "I love Doctor Strange as a kid, but he was always after Spider-Man and Batman for me. He was probably at number five for me of great comic book characters. He was so original. But when we had that moment in Spider-Man Two, I had no idea." that we would ever be making a Doctor Strange movie. So it was really funny to me that coincidentally that line was in the movie. I got to say, I wish we had the foresight to know that I was going to be involved in the project. So there it is. I knew the foresight to know I was going to be involved in the project is the giveaway that he is going to be directed, directing officially the Doctor Strange 2 uh, sequel Doctor Strange into the Multiverse of Madness that is now going to be out on November 5th of 2021. <clears throat> in the uh, Spider Man, the reference they made is in Spider Man 2, uh, J. Jonah Jameson is talking to his employee Hoffman, um, uh, and talking about how what we should name uh, the new doctor, uh, Dr. Octavius, who has eight arms. Uh, and uh, of course, Hoffman says Dr. Octopus and J. Jonah Jameson hates it. Uh, then they go through a couple of names and he says, Dr. Strange he goes, oh, that's a good one. J. Jonah said, J. Jonah Jameson says, but it's already taken. So a reference that the doctor, that Dr. Strange actually exists in the Spider-Man two universe that Sam Raimi created, uh, that in that moment we get that uh, Dr. Strange is canon in uh, that universe of Spider-Man. And then eventually J. Jonah comes back to Dr. Octopus uh, claims it's his own idea, and Hoffman just humbly uh, accepts him taking credit for Hoffman's idea. So a fun little uh, a moment there in the movie, uh, but, uh, you know, it's funny things in life. Uh, you know, all the twists and turns in life, you never know where you're going to end up and how funny a throwaway line or a fun little nod to a uh, comic book character that Sam Raimi has loved in the past now all of a sudden uh, has, uh, uh, you know, echoes in the future, echoes in the present rather, because he's going to be directing a sequel to Doctor Strange. Pretty incredible stuff. Uh, and I'm excited to see it. So now he's officially on board. Now we can start thinking about what a Sam Raimi Doctor Strange 2 is going to look like in the multiverse of madness. Of course, we're going to get Scarlet Witch involved in this one as well. And we've got plenty of time to speculate. If it's not coming out till November of next year, uh, we've got plenty of time to speculate because I think it was supposed to come out uh, in May of next year. So now it's November. So we'll see what happens uh, down the road. All right, let's get into our any, any thoughts from anybody, any uh, yeah, people think is going to be good, things of that nature. <clears throat> Donic says, Roka, you are strong in style. What about this other guy? What about this other guy? Oh, other guy, yeah, uh, Aaron is great. Yeah, let me give you a promo real quick for those of you who want to. Aaron Turner was asking me this the other day, like what he can do to get more in people's eyes, things of that nature. Because like he think because the show's not getting over a thousand views. The show's about, you know, a little bit under 500 per episode. Um, and so he's concerned that we're not getting more and more views. And I just told him it's going to take some time. People got to get to know you more and more. And I was like, just be more active in the pro wrestling stuff, more tweeting, more stuff, get involved with you and get involved in these 
these groups and things of that nature. Uh, and step by step, people get to know you, you know, and it's a pro wrestling show. It's a little niche on a channel about entertainment and sports and and uh, TV and things of that nature. So, you know, it's going to have to find its own footing. But I think if we keep at it, because I, I love our show. I think our show is fantastic. People get to know Aaron more and more. He's great. He's very knowledgeable about pro wrestling. And I almost consider him a pseudo professor on the sport. Uh, Ronnie Pitty also, will Dr. Strange have horror elements to it? Certainly a possibility. Certainly a possibility uh, for sure. And we'll see as, uh, you know, as we get closer uh, to seeing some images and seeing some, uh, maybe a, a, a teaser trailer, things of that nature coming out. We shall see. All right, let's move on to our last story uh, before I got to wrap up here in the next 20 minutes. Uh, and that is a story on this gentleman uh, right here. That is James Gunn. James Gunn. Of course, we're all sitting around with self-isolating trying to figure out how to amuse ourselves, what to do in our worlds. And James Gunn uh, tweeted out uh, his thoughts on what he thinks are the sequels that are better than the original movies. Superior sequels is what uh, a lot of people are calling this. Uh, uh, he put that out on Twitter. <clears throat> And let's take a look at his lists. Uh, I brought this, I, I did some screenshots of them here. Sequels, second movie only, better than the originals. He's got Toy Story 2, Godfather Part 2, Spider-Man 2, which we just referenced, uh, Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans, that uh, manic Nicolas Cage um, uh, Val Kilmer movie with uh, Eva Mendes uh, that, of course, uh, Bad Lieutenant was the original Harvey Keitel film, uh, a pretty nutty film, uh, and then Bad Lieutenant Protocol New Orleans. I think is actually a fun, fun watch. It's 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 super Nicolas Cage, super weird Nicolas Cage, and it's totally worth it. Evil Dead 2, of course, as we mentioned, Sam Raimi in here. Shrek 2, uh, The Dark Knight, pretty much everyone agrees with that, I think. The Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, I don't know if I go along with The Bride of Frankenstein. I like Frankenstein. The original movie is really good, damn it. Hellboy 2, uh, interesting. That could be a little bit of a hot take. A lot of people like Hellboy more than Hellboy 2, so that could be a fun battle. Road Warrior over Mad Max, no surprise. For a few dollars more, uh, oh yeah, absolutely, no problem there. Uh, of course, I think The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is superior to both of those films that came before uh, 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 in that situation. Paddington 2, X2, uh, and Empire Strikes Back. As I said earlier, people thinking Empire Strikes Back better than the first Star Wars movie that came out. I know it's episode four, but it's the first Star Wars movie that came out in my mind. All right, let's go on to the rest of them. Wrath of Khan, I'm not going to argue Wrath of Khan over uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture, even though I think the Star Trek The Motion Picture is a bit unfairly vilified by the fans. We did a breakdown of it on The Cinephiles, me and Steve Morris and Scott Mance. Uh, we did, a, I think, a two-part breakdown of uh, The Motion Picture that all three of us came away with an even deeper appreciation for that movie, even though it gets a lot of guff from Star Trek fans. Superman 2, better than Superman? No, no, I don't agree. I don't agree at all. So let's keep going. Uh, Batman Returns over Batman. Absolutely. I actually do agree with that. I think Batman Returns is ultimately much better than Batman 1989. The I think the Jack Nicholson, Michael Keaton film is a bit cheesy now. Doesn't hold up as strongly as Batman Returns still does. Yes, are there some cheesy moments in Batman Returns? Absolutely. But I think overall it's a better... Um, I don't know, better film, con better constructed film than Batman. And I will take... Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman over Jack Nicholson's Joker any day of the week, uh, any day of the week. Uh, Gremlins 2 over Gremlins. I don't know if I agree with that one. Uh, there's some weird stuff in Gremlins 2 that I'm not 100% a fan of, uh, but I enjoy Gremlins overall as a film uh, first. Uh, Blade 2, uh, interesting choice, Blade 2 versus Blade. Uh, some, there are definitely people who would defend both sides of that argument. Legend of the Drunken Master, Jackie Chan movie. Desperado, certainly better than El Mariachi Although El Mariachi has a nice quaint feel to it as a first film from Robert Rodriguez, Desperado is essentially a pseudo version of the of the El Mariachi movie, uh, kind of brought a little, well, kind of fleshed out a little bit more. Uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine over Blade Runner. That's the big one. Uh, let me see. I don't know if I can. I don't know. I don't know. Dorina, if Dorina was able to come in real quick, let me uh, send her the link uh, and see what she's up to. Um, I meant to do this at the beginning of the show. Sorry, guys. I got caught up with the Dune stuff. Uh, I don't know if she's awake, though. Uh, so she has, what, like 15 minutes to come in? Uh, uh, but I don't know if she'll be able to see her thoughts. We shall see. 
I see her come in. I'm gonna send her the invite. If I see her come in, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring her up into the uh, into the show. Um, uh, sometimes you know when you don't uh, uh, send stuff in early enough, uh, sometimes you don't get to have them on the show. Anyway, okay, Magnum Force uh, over the first Dirty Harry movie. I don't disagree with that. Final Destination two over Final Destination. Sure, Captain America Winter Soldier over Captain America the First Avenger. No doubts on my mind. Swordsman two as well over Swordsman. Add others below. P.S. It's an unarguable fact that Alien and Aliens are equal. So a fun list from uh, James Gunn, but the big one that people were uh, discussing uh, uh, over there on multiple sites and playlists is where I got the, these lists uh, from and this idea to do this on the show. Uh, the big one they are debating is uh, Blade Runner, uh, You know the film with uh, Harrison Ford there, uh, the original Blade Runner that was a fantastic film, uh, taking uh, Blade Runner 20. 49, uh, the one with Ryan Gosling, the continuation of the story, they, which uh, Rick Deckard was in, Harrison Ford was in, Anna de Armas as well, Sylvia Hoax, fantastic stuff, Robin Wright in the film, Jared Leto, uh, and a, you know, a digitized version of uh, Sean Young's Rachel in the film Blade Runner 2049 over Blade Runner. This is a hell of a thing to discuss, in my opinion. Very difficult to believe that that's true. Uh, I have a hard time uh, uh you know, kind of accepting that, but I can see the defense. I don't know what you all think, but I can see people defending that. I, I, I like Blade Runner 2049 a lot. Um, I, I think it's one of the most beautiful sci-fi films ever made, but I also enjoy the danger and the uh, threat throughout the whole story um, uh, that uh, that permeates the film. You know, this fear that the, uh, the machines will control the world and what will happen when the machines control the world. And if you've got someone as megalomaniacal as Jared Leto's character, who already has the ego of having saved the world, which we discover uh, in that text when the film begins uh, on screen, um, what could they do if they actually had an army of people like Sylvia Hoax, of uh, replicants like Sylvia Hoax, to take over the world? Uh, I think it's fantastic. I, I, I love the cinematography of uh, Blade Runner 2049. Uh, I love the score of Blade. The ben Benjamin Wallfish's score is incredible in Blade Runner 2049. I like the acting. I like the pacing of the story. Gosling's character. I will rewatch because it's on YouTube. I always rewatch the final few minutes of the movie uh, when uh, Gosling and uh, uh, Decker to show up where they show up and the things that they go through. I don't want to spoil anything, but like the things they go through at the end of that movie is pretty moving stuff for me personally. And I enjoy the fact uh, that, uh, um, that that is uh, such an enjoyable film overall. And I was surprised to find uh, how some, I'm a bit in a little bit, I'm not in the minority necessarily. It's like a 50 50 split amongst the people I know in this sphere and the pundits and critics uh, in this sphere of people that I know that Blade Runner 2049, it's mo some people don't like it, but most of the people who who don't think it's as good as Blade Runner, don't like it as much as Blade Runner, do respect the technical uh, um, uh, things about the film, but overall they don't find the story as moving as they do the original Blade Runner movie. Now, to defend the original Blade Runner movie, this is a noir. And it's a fantastic noir. It's a futuristic noir. Uh, it features one of the best performances from Harrison Ford in any film ever. Rucker Hauer is iconic. In that way, it kind of separates itself from Blade Runner 2049. It is iconic. It has an iconic villain in Rucker Hauer, Roy Batty. We don't have necessarily an, icon an iconic villain uh, in uh, Blade Runner 2049, although the closest we'll get, I think, is Sylvia Hoax's character. She's a fantastically evil replicant doing what she needs to do. I mean, when she kills David Desmalchian by chopping him in the back of the head, that is one of the most unsettlingly graphic and brutal deaths you'll see in a sci-fi movie. Um, and th Because it's simple, but it's brutal. Uh, so she is the closest thing we get. Whereas Roy Batty is dis is trying to discover, you know, he, you feel a connection to Roy Batty because he didn't ask to be born. He didn't ask to have life, to have a consciousness, you know, and yet it's being taken away from him because they're programmed to only have a three-year lifespan. So you feel a connection to Roy Batty or a, or a love to Roy uh, of Roy Batty's character more than Sylvia Hoax's character because Sylvia Hoax's character is, is just kind of carrying out the worst impulses of, uh, of Jared Leto's uh, uh, character. And so you don't necessarily feel an affinity for her, although you respect her, you have an awe in, of her abilities, you don't necessarily respect her. So where I think there's more iconic characters 
uh, that we will be talking about for years to come in Blade Runner. Uh, and it's a fantastic film for Ridley Scott, one of the best sci-fi films ever made, in my opinion, in the top five, if not top three, but uh, best sci-fi films ever made. Some people even put it number one. Um, I won't argue with that. Uh, I don't think Blade Runner 2049 is quite there. However, you know, newer eyes, newer situations, uh, people have a different a point of view, different approach, different feeling about it. So yeah, Anna de Armas, uh, Rick Samora says he's uh, madly in love with her uh, in that way. So, you know, it's an interesting, uh, I like this debate. I like the idea that it could be uh, better than uh, Blade Runner. And I think it's fun to have a debate like that. Uh, Zombie says, uh, but I think Blade Runner 2049 is super underrated. I agree. There are some people who don't uh, think it's uh, as great as uh, as the first film. Uh, certainly, that you see that. Uh, I have battles with some of my friends about that kind of stuff. Uh, Anna Diarmas is not a big star, not as big of a star yet. What role do you think will fit her in the next project? Well, she's got the James Bond movie coming, right? She's going to be in that James Bond movie. We don't know what uh, what uh, level of um, character she's going to have in the movie. Certainly, she stood out in Knives Out. People loved her in Knives Out. So you know that's that's a good thing overall. Uh, so, I mean, I enjoy that situation for her, but we don't know what she's going to do in that, uh, what she's going to have, what role she's going to have in the, in the, uh, Bond movie. Uh, please don't forget to hit that thumbs up button, share and subscribe if you hadn't. Thank you, Jake. Yeah, we got 113 of y'all in here, 112 likes. So I appreciate that. Uh, I thought we'd get a little bit higher. Usually we're around 150. Maybe people didn't like the headline or didn't want to come in. Maybe it's Wednesday morning. People are watching other things. It's hump day. So I, I respect that. Yeah, another reason to like that first film, actually, the first Blade Runner, a uh, record Howard speech at the end, and the Vangelis music. Absolutely. Although Benjamin Wallfish's score, once again, this is a fantastic score. I have to be honest with you. I listen to both scores when I'm writing or working on something or need to focus on a project. Both of those scores kind of settle me down and get me into a place that's pretty cool. Uh, let me text Arena one more time and say if she's got um, – <clears throat> Yeah, you got 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, have you on for five? I should have sent this earlier. My bad, guys. My bad. I really wanted to bring her in to have this conversation. I should have made that more of a focus than trying to get everything right about Dune. So, you know, because I wanted to respect what you guys, uh, you guys love who are massive Dune heads. I want to respect that I uh, delivered all the information correctly uh, and uh, respectfully. Let's see here. What else we got? Uh, yeah, Gotham McFarland says Rutger Hauer's speech alone makes Blade Runner better than the sequel. Absolutely. I don't disagree with you. Uh, David McKay on the Superman 2, he says, Neo before Zod. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Uh, Justin Towns says, JK, I got my sticking this today and was at the liquor store waiting for it to open. Think we're going to scuffle again tonight, most likely. I don't know what that means, but enjoy yourselves, guys. Enjoy yourselves. Uh, hey, John Roker, Brad Gilmore just tweeted out his Back to the Future is now number one on Amazon. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep, I saw it on multiple uh, things. He tweeted about it, I think, last night that he was uh, up there in the top five, so it's great to see his stuff. Go yeah, I don't have a, a graphic for it, but definitely go and uh, get his book. It's on Amazon now. Brad Gilmore, just in a quick read, it's under 200 pages about Back to the Future. He just had Leah Thompson on for an interview on his show, The Brad Gilmore Show, so pretty fun stuff. Uh, uh, and thank you, Justin. I appreciate that. Very much. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So, yeah, uh, that kind of stuff. So we'll see. We'll see uh, uh, how this all goes about. Uh, if it's, it sparks some debate online amongst people, maybe amongst your friends. Do you think Blade Runner 2049 is better than Blade Runner? Is Blade Runner a better film than Blade Runner 2049? I don't know. There's uh, Brad's book. There you go. There's the address uh, or the website address for it on Amazon. Go pick that thing up. I already have uh, what? I already have Ken's Star Wars books. You can see there over my shoulder. And behind the lunchbox is uh, Jason Inman's book uh, that I talked to him about. I don't know how to do these things. I am, there we go. Behind the lunchbox there. No, there we go. Behind the lunchbox there, I have Jason Inman's book. So I'm sure I'll be picking up uh, Brad. Or I mean, I'm sure when Brad Gilmore's book comes in, I'll be putting it back there as well. Uh, Donox says, Backdraft for the Cinephiles. Ah, uh, no, man, that's not a good movie, brother. No offense, but that is not a movie we want to cover on the Cinephiles. I do not like uh, that uh, that film. Uh, Garth Lewis says, you should have Tim Franco join you uh, via StreamYard sometime to discuss Dune. Absolutely. I've been thinking about doing a Dune kind of like um, uh, what you need to know about Dune before seeing Dune videos. So it would be kind of fun to do it with Tim, kind of comparing what we've seen from these pictures uh, versus what we know about the book. So if Tim Franco could get himself camera ready uh, and not have uh, four or five stouts before he comes on camera, then 
Absolutely. Or maybe we'll do it. Maybe we'll have a couple of stouts uh, while we're recording it and talk about it and kind of be a more relaxed kind of situation. So uh, I'm down with that for sure. Um, all right. Uh, I think that's it. I'm going to start the wrap up here of the show. I want to thank you all so much for joining me um, on the mornings with the outlaw. You know, I'm, I'm recovering from last night. We went pretty late on the outlaw nation show. And usually I wake up on Wednesdays and I'm pretty wrecked. Uh, but for whatever reason, I got a good tight six hours of sleep last night. So I'm ready to, I was ready to kind of tackle the day today. Uh, if you are a member of the Patreon, uh, for me here on the outlaw nation, let me bring that up too here, right here. Yeah, well, it's your Patreon. You can hang out with me tomorrow on camera. We usually do around 6 p.m. PT, $7 and above. Come and hang out with me for an hour. Or talk about whatever you all want to talk about. Uh, last week, we talked about hot takes and things of that nature. So come aboard with me and join me for an hour. And today, if you are $5 and above, I will be in the Discord. In the Discord uh, and we'll, for about an hour later on today, going to figure out a time to be on the Discord and just uh, shoot the shit with you guys about whatever you all want to talk about on the Discord. So come and join me on my Patreon, www.patreon.com slash John Roca. You know, having the conversation with Ben Bateman last night I, I and, and, and Mark Riley too, you, they're creating shows for their patrons. So Maybe this is a way to increase having patrons coming and joining my Patreon is creating shows that are just for the patrons. Uh, that's kind of an interesting approach to it. So I'd have to pull my patrons. And if those of you who want to go over and become uh, pages of, uh, of the Outlaw Nation, you know, supporting all the content we do here, what shows would you want me to do for just the patrons? You know, is it a voiceover show? Is it a voiceover instruction show, an acting instruction show, a hosting instruction show, um, a uh, how to analyze film? show like there's all kinds of stuff i can i can uh kind of uh, create and do for the patrons to kind of increase uh people coming over and wanting to be a part of the patron but for right now the hangouts are what i'm doing the watch alongs are coming starting next week i'm going to try to do one or two watch alongs a week that's right one or two watch alongs a week i'm going to try to do for the patrons there i think i'll put those at the ten dollar and above tier uh so you can come be a part of that and kind of watch along a movie with me live or uh, watch it uh, watch the or the recorded watch along with whenever you get around to it with the movie that we've that i've chosen or we've chosen in that way so come and be a part of the patreon a lot of stuff it's growing and growing and growing and expanding and the things that i'm doing for the patrons are growing growing and expanding as well so come be a part of it please follow me down below there at the roca says on twitter and on instagram I'm trying to get the twitter above uh, thirty five thousand. trying to get instagram above twenty thousand. so any kind of follow you can do on either of those social media media platforms would be most uh, appreciated also down below please hit that subscribe button for the uh for the um <clears throat> Outlaw Nation uh, YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button. We're trying to get above 20,000 subscribers here. A step-by-step, piece-by-piece, chunk-by-chunk, we're going to do that. So I appreciate you all uh, being a part of the Outlaw Nation and joining the nation. And don't forget, the Outlaw Nation Podcast Network is available for you as well. Just go, just type in the Outlaw Nation Podcast Network wherever you uh, download your podcasts and then go and subscribe there. It'll pop up. It's on everything. iTunes, Google Podcasts, Pocket Podcasts, uh, uh, wherever you, Spotify, Anchor, wherever you download uh, podcasts, it is available there as well. Uh, Jake Yacoveta, don't he said, uh, from Big Chuck 420, thank you so much for the birthday shout out. He can't stop smiling. It made his day out. Oh, it's my honor. Absolutely my honor to uh, wish him a happy birthday uh, to th that guy, to Ryan Hawking. To, that guy uh, is going to have a, I think he's got a, I think he's got a good future ahead of him. I got a good feeling about that kid. So I got a good feeling about that kid. So uh, much love to you, man. Happy birthday again. Enjoy some cake. Enjoy two slices on me. Enjoy two slices on me. Tell your dad, Big Chuck, to let you have two slices on me. The outlaw says, get two slices in your body, son. Get some sugar in your body. Go and take on the day. It's Wednesday at hump day. When everybody's sitting around doing nothing, you're going to have that energy to do something because you're 16 years old now. You got your future ahead of you. You want to grab that bull by the horns and ride that thing until it brings you into your success and a great life. There you go. That's a little outlaw shout out for you, Ryan Hockey. Thank you all so much again. One last thing. Anybody else uh, Anybody else in the stream labs or the super chats? Don't want to miss anybody before I wrap this thing up. Uh, but a bit of boom. Good, good, good to go. And where are we at at likes? 121 likes. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we got as many likes we as we could do on this Wednesday morning. Don't forget SCN Live starting at 10 a.m. PT. And one last uh, plug here for what do I got here coming up? Uh, yeah, Strong Style is out now. Go and listen to that. Uh, it's available for you to listen to on the podcast channel 
and on the YouTube channel. Also, I've got a Geek Buddy show coming out later or coming out tomorrow. Look for that. And of course, the top 10 is out now. Matt Nost and I, our uh, latest episode is out for you to enjoy on podcasts uh, everywhere. It is on a separate feed. It's not on the Outlaw Nation Podcast Network. It's its own feed, the top 10. Geek Buddies is its own feed as well. So enjoy both of those podcasts uh, as they come out uh, later on uh, this uh, this week. But top 10's out now. We've got Geek Buddies out tomorrow. All right, that's it for me. I'm stumbling over words. I got to go. Yeah, I love all of you. Have a great uh, rest of your Wednesday. Enjoy SEN Live. And uh, I'll see you Friday for another episode of Mornings with the Outlaw. Take care until then.